Well, welcome today to the continuation of our Functional Faith Message Series. I want to say a special welcome to all of you who are joining us at South San Jose, everybody at Sunnyvale, and those of you who are watching us in coffee shops and on your bed, watching football, multitasking. Uh, we're glad you're with us as well. This is a great day for us because we're celebrating baptisms at South Bay, and every person that goes into the water is one life that Jesus has changed with his grace and his mercy and I want to stop and pause for us as a church and recognize that this is not normal. This is not what most churches experience. And for us to be able in one service at North San Jose to see seven people take the step to go public with their faith in Jesus, there are churches that serve for a year and pray for one baptism. And God is doing something significant. And I don't say that to puff us up. I say that to help us understand the privilege that it is to be a part of a work of God and to commend so many of you who invest in people who are far from God, who've never experienced his love, that every prayer, every time you serve, every ounce of your passion and energy that you pour out, God is using you to change lives. And one of the greatest opportunities that we have in front of us as a church is two weeks away at Christmas, where there are people who will never go to church all year long, but they'll somehow come on Christmas. Your personal invitation and bringing somebody to church could result in their life being changed for all of eternity. And that could be your dad, that could be your sister, that could be your coworker, your neighbor down the street that follows Jesus. And they're in the pool in the next baptism because God used your life to make a difference. And we're going to believe that God can take ordinary people like us and do extraordinary things through us that we couldn't even think possible. And so today we want to just give him some glory for what he's doing in our church and celebrate his faithfulness. And uh, today as we continue this message series, some of you are just joining us and we've been looking at this idea of functional faith. Now, functional faith kind of is a piggyback or a play on the idea of functional fitness. In fact, last week I talked about how I started doing CrossFit this year and um, people who do CrossFit are a little bit crazy. And the first time I went out for CrossFit, I was already in decent shape. I, I worked out a few times a week, and my goal is to get a little bit better every single year. And so I thought, this year I'll try CrossFit. So you could imagine why I was surprised when like four weeks after starting CrossFit, I'm still sore. And I go up to the trainer one day afterwards, and I'm like, bro, what's up? I'm like, I am sore in places I didn't even know I had. I'm like, my earlobes are twitching and my eyelids are sore. I, I can't walk up and down the stairs. What is up with this? And he said, oh, this is what you call functional fitness. I'm like, functional fitness? What is functional fitness? And he said, well, you know, when you go to the gym, most of the time when people get a weight, they put the weight in their arms. I'll try to pull my sleeve down so you don't see my arm, but they work out their glory muscles. That's that's the muscle that does the least amount of work in your day-to-day -day life, but gets the most amount of attention. So when you compliment a guy, you don't say nice glutes, you say nice buys. You say, those arms are amazing. So the glory muscles are the ones that we all recognize. Most of the time, the dude in the gym who has a gallon of water and is walking around like he just shot steroids in his arms, he is working his glory muscles. But there are some other muscles that you actually use more often than your glory muscles. Those are your grit muscles with a T, your grip muscles. So those muscles get the least amount of attention, but they do the most amount of work. So in CrossFit or functional fitness, you're working out those muscles. So that's when you take a kettlebell and you swing it up, you're working your core, you're working your legs. So you, you might not have as big of biceps when you work out CrossFit, but this year when you put the Christmas tree up, you're not going to throw your back out. This year when you put that star on the top, you're, you're not going to pull a rib out of place this time because you've been doing functional fitness. So functional fitness is about application. It's about adaptability. It's about it applying to your life all throughout the week. So you come in here, you work out, you should be able to use it when you leave here. It's a great illustration. I'm, I'm developing a sermon as this guy's talking here, telling me all of this because a lot of us, when it comes to faith, we work out our glory muscles. We try to get more knowledge, more information. We post Instagram pictures of Bible verses so everybody knows that we can flex. We're flexing it so they think we're awesome. But what we said last week is a functional faith is integrated into all aspects of your life. See, for you, there's multiple parts of you. There's the public part of you. That's what people see in the public. 
There's the private part of you, and then there's the secret part of you. Private part of you is how you interact with homeless people, how you invest your life in people that really can't do much for you. It's how you treat your kids. It's how you interact with your parents, students. It's the stuff that's behind the scenes, under the hood. And then there's that secret part of you. It's the stuff that oftentimes the people closest to you don't even know about. See, God wants to get faith into all aspects of your life, into all components of who you are. And the greatest tool that God will use to get faith into your life is your difficulty. It's your trial. He will train us through difficulty to form and to shape our character. We looked at that last week and we talked about how we carry the weight, how we carry the problem results in either the problem working for us or against the formation of our character. Now, today I want to look at a little bit different aspect of functional faith, and I want to do a double click on something I talked about last week, and that's your perspective on your problems. In fact, I'd like to invite to the stage Daniel, if you guys will give him a nice warm welcome, Daniel, as he comes to the stage. He is, um, he's in our band here at the North San Jose campus. Unfortunately, ladies, he's already taken. Um, but last year, or last week, we did um, some moves. Sam, our worship leader here at this campus, came on stage I wore him out, so he, he's been sore all week. So Daniel is going to have some fun. Daniel, we're going to have some fun working on our burpees today, okay? Now, burpees are the most basic of functional fitness moves. And we're going to start off, first of all, Daniel, the way you do it is you take your hands out like this. Just put them out like this, okay? And you're going to go down to the ground, kind of like you're doing a deadlift. Bend a little bit right there. And then when you... When you, just making sure you're solid. And when you, when you go down, you're going to put your hands like this, okay? And then you're going to pop your feet back. That's pretty good. Now, lift your butt up just a little bit so you're straight. You're dipping too much. And then when you actually, if you do it fast, though, your chest is going to hit the ground. And then you're going to kind of snake back up. Your legs still straight. And then you're going to pop your legs up like that and jump at the top. Now, let's watch it. Let's see if you got it. Jump. Okay. Oh, one more, one more. Keep going. Let's. Go. We should have some Eye of the Tiger on right now for Daniel. Maybe next service we'll have some Eye of the Tiger. Let's give it up for him. You stay right here for a second. Stay right here. Okay. So here's what I want us to notice, though. There, there's two components to a burpee. We're going to practice it, all of us, right now in just a minute. I'm just kidding about that. But one part is that you go down, right? So go down. Just go down for a second. Just stay there. See, I was thinking the other day in my CrossFit class, how great it would be if I just stayed down when everybody else did burpees. So there are like 10 burpees and I just got down there like this and I'll just stay there, right there. And then just hope nobody notices me. And then when everybody else is done, I just go like that. I'd miss all the value though, because there's two parts of the burpee. One, I didn't tell you to get up, go back down. So one part of the burpee is when you go down, but the other part is when you come back up. So come on back up and clap on the top. See, all the strength is gained on the rebound. It's like you just go down and you stay down. You, there's no value in the burpee if you just stay down. The strength is in the bounce back. Let's give it up for Daniel as he... See, when it comes to our faith, life has a way of knocking us down. It has a way of of pushing us down more and more through trial, through tribulation, through difficulty. And there are so many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we're down today. We're down on ourselves. We're down on our relationships. We, we have this perspective on ourselves that is affecting us and our ability to, to bounce back from the difficulty. And so today I want to talk for a few moments about what is the mindset in terms of your faith that allows you to stand back up when you get knocked down. How is it that you perceive your problems that influences whether or not you'll be a person who stays down or you will be the kind of person that bounces back because the strength is gained when you bounce back, when you stand up, you go down, you come back up. And today we're going to look at an incredible story found in the Bible in Acts chapter 14. So if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to turn there. Acts chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 19. And if there's anybody in the New Testament of the Bible that had the ability to bounce back, it's the guy we're going to look at today. His name is Paul. And Paul's kind of a funny character because the first half of the book of Acts really is all about those initial disciples or followers of Jesus that spent 
time with him. When he was here and did his earthly ministry, they followed him, they, they watched his miracles, they heard his teaching, and they extended the message. That was really Jesus' commission to them was to get the message of hope that he had died on a cross and resurrected from the dead and made a way so broken people can be restored to the heart of God, not based on religion and deeds, but based on faith and what he had done on a cross. And he said, now take that to the ends of the earth. So they started taking it. But about a third of the way through the book of Acts, which is a story really of the way the Holy Spirit worked in the early church, the focal point shifts a little bit. It's still about the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit starts to use a different person. And Paul is the primary character in the second half of the book of Acts that God is using to extend the message. And it's like there's these 11 guys and they did some good, but then there's this one dude who like gets the message of Jesus to the ends of the known world. And there was something about him that was so unique compared to other people because when he started telling the message of Jesus, he would go to town, to town, to town. And the way that he would move to the next town was just once he started getting beaten in that town, he'd go to the next one. It's like, okay, they, you know, they threw me in prison. I probably should go to the next town. They beat me with rods. I should probably move on and share the message in the next town. So it was like his persecution propelled him forward. So he kept going from town to town to town to town, and finally he ends up in this one town. That's where we're going to look at in the story, and he's been run out of a few towns already. So it says in verse uh, verse 19 of chapter 14, it says, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Now, this is kind of funny because these Jews that come to Paul in the new town that he's in are the same people that have persecuted him in the last town. You ever feel like your problems keep following you wherever you go? You know, it's funny. um, Yesterday it was raining, and I like to just kind of take my kids out of the house for a few hours because if if we keep them in the house all day long, they go crazy. They act like like they're deranged, crazy, small people. They're just all over the place (laughs) if we don't get them out of the house. So we'll go to a park, but yesterday it was raining, so we go to Chuck E. Cheese, and there's this one game at Chuck E. Cheese I hate. I just hate it. From, like from the recesses of my soul, I hate the game. It's called Whack-A-Mole. You guys know the game Whack-A-Mole? Because, here's why I hate Whack-A-Mole. Because there are these little demons underneath the board, and they pop their head up, and you nail them down. So you pop one, boom, you're down. Adios, amigos. Then the next one comes up, you pop that one down. You go over here, and you pop. But, but by the time this one comes up, guess what? That one that you just, that you just popped it down is back up again. So you're going back and forth with your little mallet and you can't keep these moles down. Sometimes I feel like my life is a little bit like that. Like I thought I solved that problem, but now that problem's back again. And sometimes in our lives, our problems have a way of following us. You thought you dealt with that addiction, but now it's back again. You thought that you solved that problem in that relationship. You thought that you dealt with that mindset. But now that problem was back. You thought you progressed financially, but now you're wrestling with debt again and you just get these problems that keep coming back over and over and over again. So the real question for Paul now that he's enduring the problem again is who's going to outlast the other? Is Paul going to outlast his problem or is the problem going to put him down and take him out? So these guys follow Paul to the next town and it says in verse 19, it says, so when they came, they persuaded the crowds, people who are large crowds, large groups of people are very fickle. They're easy to to change. It's amazing. This crowd previously is wanting to worship Paul and Barnabas for their miracles. And now the next time they're about to try to crucify him or kill him. So it's amazing the way the same thing happened with Jesus. So they're excited, then they want to change their opinion, and the scripture says that finally they come and they convince the crowds to stone Paul. Now, he's not talking about recreational drug use, in case you're wondering. And then they dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Paul, at this point, his body is as good as dead. Imagine the scene. He's completely been taken out. His eyes are puffed up. He's all bloody. He's blue. He's purple. He's got these black holes in his eyes now. He's got holes all over his body. He's just barely breathing. And if it was me, it would have been the end of the story. I would have been done. And I think for so many of us, when it comes to our faith, we have a faith that when it gets knocked down once, we we just stay down. Sometimes I get one email from somebody in the church that's nasty, 
and I want to just sit in front of a TV and watch episodes of This Is Us and just eat a bunch of chocolate. <laughs> and this guy is as good as dead, and we're going to see something entirely different in Paul. He's dragged out, he's stoned, and then it says in the next verse, but then when the disciples gathered about him, See, there's something about leveraging the strength of others when you're down. Because at this point, Paul, all of his physical strength is gone. But there's some other followers of Jesus that they come and they stand around him. And it says, but then when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and he entered into the city. That's why for us as a church, what we do in terms of life groups and community is so essential. Some of you have been down for a really long period of time, and one of the primary reasons why you've stayed down is because you're isolated, because you're trying to do life alone, and that's not the way God intends for us to do life. And Paul, in this moment, is down until somebody comes and stands around him. So there's these disciples that come and they stand, and he leverages the strength of others. It says, but then when the disciples came and they gathered about him, he rose up, he entered the city, and on the next day, just one day, that's all he needed, just laid down next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby to the next town, and then watch this. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Y'all, these are the exact same towns that they were run out of just a few days ago. So they're beaten to the point of death and then God restores them. They go into the next town, they preach the message of Jesus and then they just keep walking back through the same towns that they were beaten out of. That's a faith that bounces back. What is it in Paul that gave him the kind of tenacity and passion and perseverance that he could face the problem that almost took him out, that almost took his physical life and just walk right back through the same cities preaching the message of Jesus. And then watch how he actually responds. It says, then when they preached the gospel to these towns, finally they went to Antioch and they strengthened the souls of the disciples, encouraging them I'm like, I need somebody to encourage me. You know what I mean? Like, I need somebody to tell me I'm doing a good job. I do that sometimes with Stacy. I'm like, do I look good today? Yes, I do. <laughs> tell me I'm an amazing husband. Just tell me. Tell me I'm great with our kids. I, I, I just need some affirmation and encouragement. We as human beings, we're like that. And sometimes when we're down, we just need somebody to encourage us. But something had fortified the soul of this man to the deepest recesses of who he was that he could stand up and instead of whining and crying, he's the one encouraging and strengthening others as he goes back through the towns. How many of you want a faith like that? That you can get knocked down, you can stand back up and you can be the strength for other people around you. That you can stand with such authority and power that your life becomes the very strength that people who need to be encouraged and strengthened receives. So what was it about Paul? Because it's really extraordinary if you look at most of our lives. There was something different about the way that Paul lived that resulted in a faith that bounced back that gave him the ability to respond this way. And I want us to notice, I think the secret is right here in this passage. So he goes back, he strengthens the soul of the disciples, encourages them to continue in the faith, saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. If you'd like to write in the Bible, underline, circle that word that says through. He's saying something that is so profound here. I was reading this passage of scripture a couple of months back and I was down. I was discouraged. And when I read this, God spoke right into my heart a truth that gave me such confidence that he would sustain me through difficulty. And I want to share that truth with you today. There's something in that one word that Paul is saying. Uh, it's kind of like in Colorado. Do we have any people from Colorado at South Bay Church? Um, good. Thank you very much. Because um, they're crazy about the Broncos, but the Broncos are horrible this year, just in case you're wondering. Um, but uh, in Colorado, the, the thing that Colorado is known for is the Rocky Mountains and skiing and winter storms and people fly out there and they love the winter sports of Colorado. But what they don't know is 
that there are a ton of cows in Colorado. In fact, where the Kansas Plains meet the Rockies, there are cows and bison. And there are these big, massive storms that roll down the Rocky Mountains in the summer. And the way that cows and bison respond to the storms are entirely different. And it's probably part of the reason why we eat cows more than we eat bison. And the storm comes down and the cows, this is really funny, the cows wait right until the moment that the storm hits them. And guess what the cows try to do? They try to outrun the storm. So they just, they just try to run in front of the storm, but what they do is they lengthen the time that they're actually in the storm. I mean, have you ever seen a cow run? It's like, I mean, sorry to offend you if you love cows, but that's just kind of, it's just kind of, there's not much momentum to it. But the bison, on the other hand, what they do is they wait until the exact moment that the storm hits them. And instead of trying to outrun the storm, the bison face the storm and charge through it. See, there's something different about trying to run from tribulation and difficulty versus facing it and going through it. Paul is making a statement here that is so crucial that if people who follow Jesus would understand it, it would reorient our entire lives. Because he says, warning them that through tribulation they would enter into the kingdom of God. See, God wants his kingdom to prevail in and through your life. It advances both internally in our hearts and externally through our lives. So for every single one of us, there are parts of our lives that are not yet yielded to God. There are some areas where we say yes. That's our mission statement here as a church. We exist to lead people to say yes to Jesus and passionately follow him. And our, our, our vision is that we would say yes in every facet of who we are. But we start in one spot and we're like, okay, I'll say yes in my relationships, but not yet with my finances. Or I'll say yes in my finances, but not yet over here with serving. I'll say yes here, but not here. So as the message of Jesus or the kingdom of God advances in your life, there are places that if you are truly following Jesus with all that you have, there are going to be new places where the kingdom of God is advancing internally in you, but there should also be places through you in our community, in our world, in neighborhoods around us where the kingdom of God is advancing through us. And Paul is saying that if the kingdom of God, if the kingdom of heaven, if the place where Jesus is king, his rule and his reign is advancing in and through your life, there will always be resistance. Because if you watch any battle, or you watch a movie where there's war, there is always resistance at the front lines. So if you want the kingdom of God to advance through your life and in your life, the only way for it to advance is through difficulty. Here's what I think Paul is saying, part of what he is saying here. In our minds, it matters how we think about difficulty. And some of us have this anticipation or the expectation that eventually at some point in our lives, difficulty is going to go away. I thought it when we started the church. I really did. I know it sounds stupid. I thought that there was going to be this staff utopia one day where we had like the perfect staff one day and like everybody had great attitudes and did exactly what they were supposed to do. And I can't even get myself to do what I'm supposed to do. And I'm still looking at this thing saying, actually, the further we go, the more problems we have. And now it's just that our problems have extra zeros on them. See, oftentimes in our lives, we misassume that if I get a little bit further, the problems will go away. But Paul is saying it's the preparation for difficulty that produces the ability to persevere. It's the mental framework that understands there will always be difficulty this side of eternity if the kingdom of God is advancing in your life and through your life. It's kind of like sometimes on my way home, I have a vision of what the night's going to be like when I walk through the door. I visualize the moment that the door opens, my children sprint towards me in exuberance with delight on their faces. Father, who has been working diligently and faithfully, providing for our family all day, I am filled with such gratitude in the depths of my heart that I just cannot do anything but leap with pleasure towards your presence. That's what I've, I visualize. And that all night long, they'll get along with each other, loving one another, infinite peace within our home. 
If that's my expectation, I will be sorely disappointed when I walk through the doors of my house because oftentimes they're playing on their technology and they're like, sup, sup, sup. <laughs> I'm like, sup? I'll show you sup. <laughs> See, often for me, I, I, just, I, I think it's just going to all go great. Perfection is what's going to happen in front of me. But when I change my mindset and I understand, no, actually, when I get home, I'm, I might have to deal with some bad attitudes and kids are going to fight and bedtime's going to be frustrated and they're going to have to go pee 18 times after I put them down and they're going to want a sip of water and then they're going to still fight and one's going to want the door open. I'm going to close it. She's going to open it after I close it. And that's our night. That's, that's this season of life. But it's when I prepare myself mentally for the difficulty, I'm able to persevere through it in a different way. So Paul is saying the preparation for difficulty produces in you perseverance. But I want to I go a little bit further into that because practically speaking, what does that actually look like for our lives? I want to give you three things that come straight from this passage that I think apply to our lives around this principle. The first one is that if we are going to persevere, we have to change the way we see our problems. One of my mentors, who's possibly the wisest person I know, he is a pastor of a church in Texas, has kind of a slight southern twang, and he's a great leader, very driven. He's a visionary, but he's also laid back. It's, a, it's, it's confusing to me. So one time I'm like, Pastor Steve, what is it about you? Like, you're so passionate, but you're laid back. And he launches into a story, and he says, well, you know, um, one time I was on my way back from traveling, and on the conveyor belt, my luggage didn't come through. And I used to get so frustrated when my luggage didn't come through and I'd just be angry all night long because my luggage didn't come through and I'd be angry at the airline, I'd be angry at everybody else around me because the luggage didn't come. And then I started realizing that about one out of every 10 times my luggage doesn't come through. So now when I walk up to the conveyor belt, I just think to myself, this might be the one out of 10 times my luggage doesn't come through. So when my luggage comes through, I'm really excited about it. When it doesn't, I think it's the one out of 10 times. That's brilliant. See, he's, he's reframed his problem. Some of us, we, we think that problems are evidence that things are falling apart for us. But I think a part of the reason why Paul persevered is because he understood that the problem actually was evidence of progress. These people who persecuted him from town to town, it was par for the course. And if he was going to live his life on mission for Jesus, there would be some problems along the way. There would be some difficulty that he would endure as a result of his obedience and the kingdom of God advancing through his life. So, so many of us, the way that we frame our problems is we think, well, because we have a small problem, it's a massive issue that our life is falling apart. And I love how sometimes people just come to me as a pastor I'm like, did you know that this church has some problems? <laughs> I'm like, really? No way. Because I just thought it was perfect. I just like, I mean, I, I just thought everything worked exactly the way it was supposed to work every single week. I mean, it's just perfect life group leaders, perfect volunteers on our dream team. And the reality is, if, if you do anything that is going to make progress with your life, you're going to have problems. So if you can start to see your problem is evidence of your progress, it changes your perspective. Y'all, this is very helpful. At least for me, it was. When I began to realize that when we have problems in our church, when we have problems in our marriage, when I have problems with my kids, when I have problems internally over my own hard attitudes, that God is forming me and shaping me. And the fact is that those problems will always exist. It'll be a different problem. And the hope is that it's not hitting your head against the wall and doing the same problem over and over again. But as you advance, there will always be problems that trail with you if you're going to follow Jesus. So we're going to reframe and we're going to realize that our problems are evidence of our progress. Secondly, though, is that we have to make a choice of our path based upon destination and not based upon comfort. See, so many of us are so resistant to pain. And I don't blame you. I understand. In fact, if you watch TV for more than 10 minutes and you get on Hulu, who now apparently when you pay 10 bucks a month still puts five commercials every eight minutes. <laughs> Those commercials are almost always about avoiding pain. Have you ever noticed that? It's like this drug 
might cause you to have hemorrhoids, and but you won't have pain for 10 minutes. It's like marketed, marketing to us that if we avoid the pain, eventually the pain will go away. But if you live long enough, you understand that either you get the pain of progress or the pain of regret. That's the choice. It's kind of like my kid's playroom. They've got this playroom and Please, uh, you know, humor me with all these children illustrations. It's just my season of life. Uh, but they have, they have this playroom, and they don't like to clean it up. So sometimes when they don't want to clean up their playroom, I kind of subconsciously will avoid making them clean it up. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I know that they're going to pitch a fit like I'm not feeding them for a month when I tell them they got to clean up their playroom. So as a bad parent, I'll just avoid it. And then what happens eventually is then I walk into the playroom and I realize that there are cockroaches in there and stuff. I'm just kidding about the cockroaches, but it's, it's really bad. And at this point, I'm like, now we got to clean this thing up and it's going to take us three hours. And by the time we're done with it, kids are fighting and pulling each other's hair. And it's a huge mess because we didn't deal with it when it was small. We avoided the pain, but the pain got worse over the course of time. See, in our lives, oftentimes, we intuitively know that there's going to be pain when we're, we're going to make progress in any area of our lives, but we just try to shortcut the pain, hoping that the pain never comes. But nobody who has a great marriage has ever had a great marriage without some pain that they had to work through. Nobody who has great relationships with their children does without some difficulty. There's no student who does good on their tests and has great grades and perseveres without some pain in the process. If we're going to make progress, there has to be pain. And the question I have for you is, what is the pain that you're trying to avoid? God's knocking on the door of your heart, and you're trying to avoid it. And he's saying, no, if you will choose your path based upon the destination that I have for you, I'll give you the strength in the midst of it. And then over the course of time, you will not have the pain of regret. You will have the blessing of obedience upon your life. Is it your marriage? Is it your finances? Is it your relationships? Is it the obedience to share God's love with the people around you at your place of work? Is it living your life on mission? Is it doing something in the lives of people who are homeless? What is the thing that you've been avoiding the pain on? We're going to choose our path based upon destination and not pain. And then the third and final point is that we're going to celebrate progress and not perfection. See, so many of us have this mindset in our lives that we are striving for perfection. I read this great books, book called Mindset, and it was all about two primary mindsets or ways that people look at life. One is a fixed mindset. That's the mindset that says your strength, your talent, your giftedness, your capacity is fixed. You're born into the world, you have a certain level of talent. And then the other is a growth mindset, which says it can get better. You can grow. You can get stronger. Your capacity can increase over the course of time. See, a fixed mindset pursues perfection, but a growth mindset pursues progress. Some of us, we're down on the ground, and we're the ones speaking into our ears about how bad of a job we're doing. I can't believe you're still struggling with that same thing over and over and over and over again. I can't believe that that's your attitude. I can't believe that that's your addiction. I can't believe you related. I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you did this. One time I was um, at a camp with my kids and I had a couple of times where I had bad interactions with them and I was so down on myself all weekend. And I had taken a whole weekend to invest in them and love them and I had like two bad moments and all I heard was this voice over and over and over and over again in my ear. And then I felt like God was saying to me so clearly, Andy, I want you to look how far I brought you. I want you to look where you were a year ago and two years ago and how much more patient and kind and loving and you're investing in these kids and you are pouring into their lives and you're teaching them what I'm teaching you. You are doing the best you can with what's in your hands. So I want you to stand back up and I want you to celebrate the progress that you've made. Some of you are down on yourself and God wants to say to you, I want to celebrate your progress. You've done so good. You've come so far. If you could just see how far you've come. And you know, part of it is this like self-efficating, self-disparaging voice that we speak to ourselves. Like we feel better about just negative talk to ourselves. But God gets glory for the progress that you've made. So every time you're down on yourself, you're not just robbing yourself of the ability to bounce back. You're robbing God the glory 
that he deserves for your life, for the difference that he's made in you. And God is saying today, no, no, no. I want you to celebrate the progress. You know, this year, God's done great things in our church. And I've been trying to celebrate it because there's a part of me that sees the future and I see the problems and I see how I see the difficulty that we face behind the scenes. And I've felt like God is saying to me as a leader and as a husband and as a father that I want you to celebrate how far you've come. I want you to stand in front of your staff and tell them it's not normal for 130 people to get baptized every year. It's not normal for 200 people who at the beginning of the year were heading towards eternity apart from Jesus to trust in him and their lives are changed forever. It's not normal to have 70% of your church connected into a life group. God's doing great things and we're making so much progress as a church because the grace and the mercy of God. And I, as I was thinking about Paul and this story, God just spoke so deeply into my heart because I had the thought, what if he stayed down? What if he just said, I'm done? It's, it's too much. Some of you are down today and you're about to quit. You're about to give up on God. You're about to give up on your marriage. You're about to give up on school. You're about to give up on your kids. You're about to give up on your future. You're about to give up on the mission God's put in your heart. And God's saying, no, 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 no. You went down, but now's your time to bounce back. All the value of your trial is on the rebound. It's the functional standing up where the strength is regained. You're tore down, I build you back up. You're tore down, come back, he's saying. And I, I went to this passage, in fact, I read it this week, and it's not on the screens. So I just want to read it to you because I felt like God spoke to me as I was reading this other story, and then Paul would write this letter about his persecution. It's like he, he does a double click on his persecution to describe what he's thinking as he's being persecuted. And he says in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8, some of you might want to go back and look at this later in the, the week. He says, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of the affliction that we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired even of life itself. In fact, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Paul had received a death sentence in Acts chapter 14. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He's delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. And on him, we have set our hope and he shall deliver us one more time. See, the, the reality of the gospel message of Jesus, the good news, Jesus came down. He did. That's, that's awesome. He was in a manger and he went to a cross for the sins of the world. But the real value in the fact that we know he was more than just a man was not just that he was crucified and that he came down, but the value that proves that he was God was that he went back up. And after three days in a grave, he conquered death victoriously, proving that he was God in human flesh. So the scripture says that the same power that brought Jesus from death to life is the same power that was available to Paul. And Paul had to get knocked down to realize that that resurrection power could cause him to stand back up. So some of you today, you're down, but God is saying there is resurrection power available to you to rebound today. That the same God that conquered the grave, the same spirit that lived and breathed in Paul, the Holy Spirit is available to you today if you will just receive it. Will you rebound with his strength so that you can stand, so that your life can be evidence of his glory and his power. You're not where you're going to be, but you sure are not where you were. And today God is saying, celebrate it. Celebrate my goodness and my kindness and my faithfulness over your life. God, thank you today that you're a God that takes people who are down and you bring us 
back to life. Thank you for the stories of people who were buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in the newness of life. Thank you for the power of the cross and the empty tomb that declares hope to us that our defeat doesn't have to be our destiny, but by your grace, we can stand. By your power, we can be born, resurrected to life. Thank you today that that can be our story and we will give you the glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen.